Good uh, morning. Um, please uh, welcome our next speaker, Honza Kral, who will be talking about designing a Pythonic interface. Thank you. Hello and good morning. As has been said, my, uh, my name is Honza Kral, and I would like to talk to you about designing a Pythonic interface. And uh, the better title probably for, for my talk, which only occurred to me later, is an illustrated guide to this. Because you all know what happens in, in Python if you, if you type import this. You get sort of a, a mission statement, a set of guiding principles of, of Python itself and uh, for Python code uh, in general of how it should look and how it should behave. And that is what really this talk is about, how to take those principles and apply them to designing an interface to a, to a foreign system. So first, a little little motivation, what, what brought me here. And that's, that's Elastic, the company that I work for, where I actually create a, a, a Python client for Elasticsearch. It's a search and analytics engine, and it's not at all important for this talk. But what is important is we'll be using it for some, for some examples, so don't be, uh, don't be alarmed if you see some JSON somewhere in there. So let's get to it. So import this, the, the Zen of Python. Uh, as I said, a guiding set of principles. And I always like them, you know, they sound cool and they, they really make sense to me. But I always struggle a little bit, how do you up actually apply them? How do you apply them to code? Does that actually translate? Does it make any sense? In this talk, I would like to share how I actually discovered, or maybe I just rationalized it away, uh, doesn't really quite matter probably, uh, how I discovered how I use these principles when I design a new API and how I actually apply them in a real life. And because I actually said I a lot, in, just in the past sentence, a little bit of disclaimer is in place. This is obviously my personal opinion. This is what I find that works for me. And also, some of you may have seen my code and documentation or lack thereof. So please do as I say and not as I do, because I certainly am not, am not perfect and uh, my code definitely reflects that. So, any good talk begins with the definition, right? So API, what do we mean by API? What do we mean by, by an interface? So uh, for, for this talk in particular, we mean a Python API, an interface to a foreign system. So something that will allow you to talk to a third party system, in our case, uh, Elasticsearch. And this is something that typically you don't need in Python. I mean, Python is Turing complete, right? You can write absolutely anything in Python. So you don't need these interfaces. You can communicate directly especially in case uh, like, like Elasticsearch, which actually just speaks HTTP and JSON. You can just use uh, requests or any other favorite HTTP library and talk to it directly. But that's not really what you want to do. You don't want to keep rediscovering the, the wheel, and that's why we have APIs. The, some, somebody created an API to make things simpler, to, uh, to hide away the complexity. So you might uh, talk about an API in this case that it is a service for code, for the real code, for the code that actually does the work, for the application code. And there is a huge difference between uh, the, the code of the API and the code of the application, the, the, the real code. Because the API is really, doesn't really apply for a specific use case because the API doesn't know anything about the real code. So it can be used by many different people in many different organizations, and hopefully it will be. Like that's sort of what you hope for when you create an API, right? That people will use it, that it will spread. So uh, the application, on the other hand, is always written to solve a specific purpose. So the API fulfills a contract. For, uh, for that code. 
And the contract can be either explicit or implicit. It can either be explicit via documentation. You can document the contract. You can say, these are the methods, these are the responses, and that's probably something that you should have either way. But it can, you can also have sort of an implicit contract, a, a cultural one, if you please, uh, which sort of uh, makes the API behave as you would expect it. It should be, it should be natural, and you should be able to uh, rationalize and, and to think about uh, the API and avoid any, any surprises. That's sort of what you want for the users of your API, to be able to use it as if it were part of their system, to not having to think about it too much. Uh, but first of all, we need, to, we need to address some of the issues with the API. The first one is that the API is vaguer than, uh, than application code. And yes, I actually had to look this up. It is an actual word. I wasn't sure for a while. It is actually, it is actually accepted by the dictionary. Okay, the, the, the British protest again. <laughs> what a surprise. So it is a lot vaguer. It doesn't really know what it's gonna be used for. An application code is specific. It solves, an, it solves a problem. You create an application to scratch an itch to, uh, to uh, deliver a solution to your customer or uh, to power your product. But your API can be used in so many different ways that you never, you never know. And making any sort of assumptions on how your API is gonna be used is, can, be very, can be very difficult. So ultimately, the API is just a tool, and you always have to keep that in mind, that it's a tool that, should be a, uh, that anyone should be able to wield to create application. And it's a tool to uh, simplify access. And to simplify access, the crucial part there is to simplify. And we have our first line from the Zen of Python. Simple is better than complex. Complex is better than complicated. And that is the purpose of the API, to actually facilitate this, this line, to take something that would be complicated, opening a, a socket, creating an HTTP header, sending it over, creating adjacent body, sending it over, receiving some responses, determining if everything went okay, et cetera, et cetera. That's definitely unnecessary complex. And that applies to, to anything. If you want to work with HTTP, you also probably wouldn't start with raw socket, but you would use something like requests, a, a, a well-designed library that just uh, gives you exactly the functionality that you need in a way that you can that you can use. So that's uh, that's what simplifying access is about. It's about hiding complexity. So this is a query for uh, to Elasticsearch. Don't worry if you if you don't understand it. Uh, essentially, what this is is I'm looking for something that uh, that matches Python in the title. It must not match beta in the description. So I'm looking for release. I'm uh, filtering only those packages in category search, and I want to do some aggregations. I want to see the distribution of tags and the maximum lines. So just some, just some query, assuming, assuming a data set, and that query is not important. What is important, that there is a lot more things on the screen than what I just read. And I read all that this does. In the end, I, it just prints it out uh, with the relevancy score and the, and the title of the, res of the document. So there isn't really a lot, a lot of things actually going on, but there is a lot of things that are being typed there. So how do we, how do we simplify that? How do we hide the complexity? Well, this is what I came up with. And I'll spend the rest of my talk explaining to you why and how I came up with that. I already see some people cringing because they've used this code before. That's never a good sign. Okay, so in this case, I try to extract only the things that are relevant, only the stuff that I actually read, only the action items, not really, uh, not really all the gravy, all the boilerplate code. And to me, that's what an API should do. It should 
hide away all the boilerplate while leaving all, and that's, that's the crucial part, while leaving all of the important parts. Not just some, but all of the important parts. Uh, and that's sort of the embodiment of another line of the Zen of Python. Be explicit. Explicit is better than implicit. So while I, I hid away a lot of the complexity, I didn't hide away the crucial parts. And that's sort of the uh, very important decision, what to hide and what not to hide. Because you can always go the, the next step. You can always imagine how you could make this even simpler. Uh, for example, just creating some sort of query language where you would just say the three words and say this should be there, this shouldn't, and this must be there as a filter, et cetera. But at that point, it's, it's getting hard to read, it's getting hard to get into, it's getting hard to reason about. So be explicit. And uh, in, in the word of code, what that means is when you're hiding com uh, complexity, do hide the mechanics. Do not hide the meaning. So if you're doing an HTTP uh, request with uh, requests, you still have to know what is the difference between get and post and put. That is the meaning. That is not the mechanic. What you don't really want to know about is about sockets and, and parsing of HTTP headers. You just want a convenient access to it. So that's mechanics. That's something that you should hide away. That's something that's not specific to the problem. That's specific to the implementation. So this is sort of how, how, you, uh, how you draw the line, what to hide and what not to hide. So if we look into, into the, the, original, uh, the original code, uh, so you, you see I've highlighted the parts that are actually just the mechanics. Uh, sorry about this. Uh, where you see that I have a, I have a bool query, which, which has three branches, must, must not, and filter. And those can be, those can be very confusing. And also, they don't matter. They don't, con they don't carry any information. They are just a, a, a way that the query DSL, the language that Elasticsearch uses based on JSON, how it expresses how to combine other queries. It is, it is the how. It is not the what in this case. This is not what you want to do. This is how you want to do it. And this is something that I, I don't want my, uh, my users to have to know in order to use my library. However, I am fully comfortable uh, in forcing them to know all the rest. So I, that's all that I hid. I never, I never hid the match or, or the term query. So this is the meaning. You still have to know what is the difference between a term query, a match query, and how to do, how to do a negation. In this case, the negation is in Python, so we should uh, all be familiar with it. But uh, that's the meaning. That's the same as requests still asking you to know the difference between HTTP GET and HTTP POST. Uh, if I if I hit this away, it would make a lot of a lot of people's lives easier. But then you would have a very narrow ceiling after which uh, there is nothing there is nothing you can do. And also, this means that I don't have to uh, teach my users everything. They can just use the skills that they already have by understanding the query DSL of Elasticsearch itself. On the other side, with the request example, uh, people understanding HTTP and HTTP methods. I don't have to reinvent that. It's already there. People already know it. So all I have to do is give them access to it. And a similar thing goes for, goes for the results. Here I have some, some crazy dictionaries with, uh, with underscore source and underscore score. Uh, that can be a little difficult. And again, it just bears no meaning. 90% of the time, people just want access to the fields or alternatively, the meta fields. So again, just abstract it away, hide it, and also provide a more convenient way to access it. So instead of square brackets and quotes and underscore source, in every single line, just use 
title. So this is something that just simplifies the mechanics while not actually taking anything away. And also, uh, it's good to fully admit to the leakiness. So in this case, still showing all the different, all the different query types, uh, all the different aggregations, you see that I still force uh, the users to name their aggregations just as they would in the, in the query DSL so they can them, then get them back in the results. It's a very thin, abstract layer. Exactly because I want uh, people who use Elasticsearch in some other context, maybe from another language, maybe directly through the browser or the command line, I want them to be more effective. I don't want them to have to learn yet another tool to do what they already can do. And also, once they learn this tool, I don't want that to go to waste if they have to change to th something else or if they have to ask for advice online. If I, if I created my own complete query language and then I had to uh, ask someone uh, on the internet, so this is what I'm doing with Elasticsearch, can you help me? Well, the answer will be no, because nobody else will understand that query language. So the standardization, the, the uh, leaky abstraction here is very, very important and very deliberate. And it is also because, well, I'm lazy and I don't want to rewrite the entire documentation of Elasticsearch, what query does what. Here's that too. So that's sort of uh, another guiding, guiding principles. Be familiar. Uh, present to the user something that they, that they know from somewhere else. Uh, whether, it's a, whether it's a universal concept like uh, different types of HTTP requests or uh, different types of queries in Elasticsearch or something that's already been used before. So don't be afraid to just copy shamelessly from stuff that you've seen around. So essentially you could sum up the, the library that I created, the Elasticsearch DSL, as a combination of these two things. Uh, the second one we've already seen, that's just using the raw Elasticsearch API. And the first one, well, that's Django query sets. So that uh, I borrowed some, uh, some patterns from Django, some patterns from Elasticsearch, and combine them together. So for example, the, the chaining, the, the fact that every additional filter, whenever you add a filter, you will get return a copy of the, of the query that comes, from, that comes from Django. That's something that people uh, expect or at least are familiar with. And then you have all the different, all the different query types that come from, from Elasticsearch. So Python people who want to use Elasticsearch should be familiar with both of these concepts and the API should feel homey to them, should feel familiar. They shouldn't be surprised and they should be, uh, they should be effective. So once I did that, I uh, turned into an, uh, to another rule, be consistent. Once you figure out your approach, stick to it. So special cases aren't special enough to break the rules. So every single method that you have on, uh, this, uh, on the search object in Elasticsearch DSL will return you a copy. The, the chaining works uh, just as expected. And uh, the other important part that people sometimes forget about when talking about consistency is the naming. Name things consistently. Na name things consistently with other systems, but more uh, exactly within your system. Always call it the same, uh, and that is both in your code and also in your in your documentation. And of course, only do this if this makes sense. Because practicality always beats purity in in Python. Like we are, we are practical people. We we're not really interested in the in the pure uh, uh, purity just for just for its sake so don't be afraid to make an exception like try not to make one but if you have to that's okay so in our case 
we have we have the queries on at, uh, at the top that follow the pattern. Every t every call to a method will create a clone of the query object, uh, mutate it, and return it. However, when I tried to do this for uh, for aggregations, this just didn't work because aggregations can be nested. And the first way how people, uh, me including, try to represent nested aggregations would be just to nest, uh, nest the chaining calls. And at that point, it all broke down. I couldn't no longer be creating a copy after every, after every call. So I had, to, I had to break the pattern. So when you access s.ags, uh, it's actually done in place. So don't be afraid to break the rules. Try not to, but also keep in mind that it might happen that you just will have to. And that's okay. The Zen of Python says so, and smarter people than me wrote that, so I'm okay with it. Another very important rule when designing an API is be friendly. Uh, be friendly to your users uh, on both sides. Be friendly to the users of your API, but also be, be friendly to the system that you're trying to uh, simplify access to. And to me, uh, the only non-obvious part, well, hardly obvious because it's still pretty obvious, is to realize that Python is interactive. A lot of people use Python from stuff like IPython or they use fancy IDEs to explore the, the APIs. And you should, you should be able to support this. You should be able to help them with that uh, by providing them all the tools that they could uh, that they could ever need. In the case of Python, those those are the three main ones: uh, their uh, representation and and doc strings, which, if uh, if implemented properly, will greatly help with uh, with actually. Uh, allowing the users to explore the, uh, the API and start using it. Both the beginner users who just came to your uh, code for the first time and are just exploring around, and also the advanced users where this can greatly speed up, uh, speed up the process. Uh, for, uh, for example, the, the representation uh, string is, uh, often underestimated, and it can be super useful. Uh, one of the most common questions that I get with Elasticsearch DSL is, I have this crazy query in, in JSON that somebody wrote or some other tool generated. How do I express this in Elasticsearch DSL? Well, I say, that's easy. You just create a query out of it by wrapping it in the, in the queue object and just ask for the representation. And what you get back is exactly the code that will that it would take to reconstruct that just using uh, just using uh, the DSL library. So that's what really the representation string should be a, a representation of the object that you can essentially retype into Python and get the same thing. In some cases, it's not practical if you have large objects, obviously, or you have something that can only exist uh, exist once. It's not that useful, but in this case, it is definitely definitely very useful, and it saves me a lot of time uh, because this is something that I myself use quite often. That I have this I have this crazy dictionary containing a crazy query with ten different subqueries and fifty aggregations, and I want to manipulate it. And manipulating the dictionary itself is, is quite difficult. That's why I created this library in the first place. So I just wrap it in the, uh, wrap it in the uh, queue object, get the query object that I can work with, and uh, then when I want to uh, put it in my code, I can use the representation and, and put it in there. And uh, of course, uh, of course, doc strings, uh, be, uh, be nice to your users, uh, provide even some examples in your doc string. Those are the most useful. If you're, if you're reading, if you're reading uh, a header of a method like this, 
it's pretty uh, pretty evident what it does. But if it were anything more uh, more involved with more parameters, it's always nice to include an example right there, both for when somebody is reading the code, and also when somebody is just looking in their IPython uh, of on what's what's actually what's actually going on. So that's one part of Python being interactive. That's the more obvious part. The second part is enable iterative build. Because again, the Zen of Python teaches us that flat is better than nested and sparse is better than dense. So what does that mean? If you if you build something up, if you if you want to build a, a sophisticated query into Elasticsearch, you keep adding clauses. First filter on this, then on that add this aggregation, and if the user requested this filtering, add this kind of filter. So there is a complicated state that you need to remember what the query currently looks like. And it's a, a sign of a polite API, as I would call it, that it doesn't force you to remember the state, but it can store the state internally. So you can use the API from the get-go and start building your query in this case, or your request uh, in other cases. And uh, you don't have to store everything yourself. So in our case, it looks like this. You can also see that this uh, enables for nice practices like commenting the code and actually explaining to, uh, to the users what they're doing. And I can go line by line and very easily, very easily deconstruct it. Even if uh, you're new to, uh, new to Elasticsearch, you would probably be more or less able to tell what this does, especially with the comments. So, sure, there's still, some, there's still some magic. There's still something that's specific to Elasticsearch. We've talked about the term and match and all the different uh, weirdness of the syntax. But overall, this should not be surprising. I, I want to only filter category search, then I want to match uh, the title to Python, et cetera, et cetera. But the most important part is I don't have to first build up some weird dictionary containing all the keyword arguments or uh, represent the state in any way. I can just keep creating and keep adding to the search object and uh, be, uh, be happy with that. So iterative build, it's uh, often something that's, that's uh, underappreciated because it allows you to not care about the, st about the state, which can, be, which can be very hard. And finally, when we're talking about being friendly, safety is also very friendly. You should always fail explicitly Unless, unless it's explicitly silenced. So all your defaults uh, should, uh, should actually be the safest possible. So if you, have, if you have any option to fail, for example, Elasticsearch will always give you a response even if only 20% of your data is available. It will give you a response and say, hey, I only see 20% of your data, but here, have some, have some results anyway. And then it's up to the user to decide whether that's good for them or bad. Uh, when faced with a decision like this, like do I, do I fail in this case or is it okay and do I leave it to the user? I say always fail, but allow the user to override it. Allow the user to say I, I'm aware that this is a situation that might happen and I don't care. But at that point, you force the user to explicitly uh, own uh, the responsibility to maybe even do some, do some research. You've noticed that that's something that, uh, that I've repeated uh, quite often during this talk, uh, to not be afraid to force the user to actually learn something about what they're doing. And this one is particularly important because hey, it, deals with, it deals with safety and it helps prevent nasty surprises once the user moves to production. Also, think about how you test your code and how other people test their code. Provide some sort of, of 
uh, dummy interface or maybe just a, a set of test, uh, test case classes uh, for, uh, for the, uh, your favorite testing libraries out there so that uh, people have lower barrier to entry to do some testing. Essentially, obey the testing goat. Make the testing as simple as possible uh, because that's what you want to do. Ideally, you already have some code like that somewhere, somewhere in there already because you should be testing the API. So it's only a matter of exposing, exposing that part also to, to your users, sort of a test helpers or something like that. And the final chapter is about API still being code. It's different from an application code and uh, we've, we've highlighted the reasons how, but it's also similar in, in a lot of cases. It needs to be tested. Things can change and you might need to, you might need to adapt. Also, there is a there is a lot of a uh, lot of decisions going into how do you decide what goes in and what doesn't. What are what are the features that you want as part of your library, as part of your API, and what do you leave sort of as an exercise to the user? Do I provide this set of helpers? Do I uh, uh, do I expose this functionality, this, this parameter, or is it only used by a, by a very few people? And there are, there are several, several ways how to, how to do that. First of all is the actual decision. But second is, that's my favorite, to avoid that decision and allow the more advanced users to sort of, to always step away a little bit and provide them uh, access to the lower, la lower layer, the, more low-level API. In case of Elasticsearch, I can always go one step back and just send in a raw dictionary. If I don't want to create uh, the query using the, the iterative syntax that I just showed you, I can always just create it myself. And at that point, I don't have to care what options are supported by the DSL and which aren't. I can just do everything manually and send it back. The same Again, it's not a novel idea. It's the same with the dot raw method on Django uh, query sets, where you can just send in a, a, a SQL query when you don't want to rely on the ORM to generate one for you. So always allow access to uh, the lower level if at all possible. And also admit that no code is perfect. And that goes especially for, uh, especially for APIs because they are vaguer than, uh, than the actual application code. And when deciding what to include and what not, uh, keep in mind the last line of Zen of Python that we'll deal with today is, now is better than never, although never is uh, often better than right now. And that's, the, that's, the, an, important, that's an important thing. Uh, when you don't know whether to include something or not, it's perfectly fine to say no especially if you, if you have a way for the user to, to move around you. And so I always prefer to give them a way around my code than to try and support all the different possible avenues through my code, because that can lead to a nightmare. That can lead to a nightmare for my users with an overwhelming amount of options, and definitely for an, uh, in a nightmare for me, with supporting all the different, all the different combinations. So, so think about what makes sense and how hard it is to do it without direct support in your code. If it means that uh, when I'm not supporting this option, a user will have to uh, create a dictionary and send it in manually, I'm okay with that. If it means that they will have to instantiate a new connection and talk to a socket directly and, and do some other complicated stuff, maybe not that much and I want, to, I want to provide them that functionality directly. So that's sort of the last part of how you decide what to support and what not to support. And now I believe we have 10 minutes for questions. Uh, if you don't get your questions answered or you just wanna yell at me, there is my, there is my Twitter. And 
Anybody who has any questions? Thank you. Thank you for your talk. And uh, I had a question. So um, if we create a great API uh, with expressive, API, uh, with expressive uh, syntax, um, don't you think that we're making the internals of the, of the API more complex and really hard to maintain? Can we avoid that? Uh, yes, uh, there, there, there is n not necessarily a correlation between the complexity and the, and the ease of use. Yes, sometimes uh, you might need to resolve to more complex things like using meta classes and descriptors if you want to make things nice, uh, but it's not, it's not necessarily true. So it might happen, but it, uh, but it doesn't have to. There is, there is no direct correlation there. Okay. Thanks. Anyone else? Two gentlemen. Hi. Um, what role do you think emulating built-in objects or using like Python types, like the built-in types, comes into uh, writing a Pythonic API? For example, when like when should you do you think uh, you should use dictionaries? Uh, lots, or should you instead use like make a little DSL for your particular thing? Or I see. Uh, so I, I prefer to uh, again uh, decide what can you take away, and then compare the results. So if if I use raw dictionaries, and if I if I create my own thing, what part of the pain goes away? Is it enough to justify the, the, the extra dependency, the work that will go into the API, et cetera? Just sort of do this exercise in your mind, like, okay, these things I can, I can abstract away, these things I can generate automatically, so the user will only have to put in these, these four things, and then compare the results. It might be that the differences wouldn't be big enough to justify creating a DSL, uh, creating a, a, a library, from uh, both the point of putting the work in and also forcing the people to, to learn that. So that's, that's what I do, like every, every time. I sort of mock up how the API would look like and then I compare. Is it worth it or is it not? Does it make sense? Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Do we have anyone? Okay, if you have any more questions, you can just grab them at coffee or during lunch. Give them a big hand of applause. Thank you.